Thank you so much, Kavita. It's, um, again, just a major shout out to Media Mahima and taking this on and providing this service for the community. It's imperative and highly important to encourage this kind of dialogue and discussion. So we've been talking a lot about what we should be eating and what we should be exercising, and a huge component of that, of course, is going to be our mental health. So before I go into this, I want to just have you take a moment to pause and think about what mental health means for you. When I say that word, what kind of images, what kind of thoughts, who pops in your mind? So with that, I want to go into talking about kind of where the stigma around mental health comes into play. I went online and looked at, you know, mental health, and this is a word cloud that popped up. So if you see any of the words that you thought of connect with any of these words, I wonder if there's a resemblance. Something that I found interesting is when I do that search, I didn't see many that supported sleep, exercise, speaking to a therapist. When I think of mental health, all of a sudden we go to the negative. Why is that? Well, up until the 17th century, unusual behaviors were actually seen as evil. And it wasn't until the concept of change happened or people started to think about what do we do with that behavior, it evolved into illness. And that's where we are now. So that journey of kind of exploring what it means, what mental health means to you, is not only a personal journey, but it's also a very community-based journey. So something that I wanted to share, because mental health oftentimes is kept in silence, Here's a story by a woman by the name of Priya Alika Elias, and she wrote something called The Silence About Mental Health in South Asian Culture is Dangerous. I don't know when the last time you were read to, but relax in your chairs. It's always challenging to talk after lunch, right? So take a moment to relax. Close your eyes if you'd like to. I'll wake you up at the end of the story. But just imagine you sitting next to this individual and seeing what her journey is like. On November 14, 1998, a young Indian man named Neil Grover killed himself. Neil was bright, he was studying to become a doctor, and doing well in medical school. His mother said he had always been happy. She couldn't understand why he might have felt the urge to take his own life. His suicide note was cryptic as the act itself. I had everything, but life is a double-edged sword. If I tell everything, I will lose everything. And that's what it meant to him. I repeated the lines to myself over and over as I could stumble upon their meaning. But of course, I couldn't. He was like Srinivas, another South Asian medical student who also committed suicide. His family also couldn't imagine a reason. And both Grover and Srinivas were successful as Gupta, the Goldman Sachs analyst found dead after working 100-hour work weeks. The cause of Gupta's death had not yet been determined. His father, Sunil Gupta, wrote this of his son. He started complaining, this job is not for me. It's too much work and too little time. I want to come back home. We as parents counseled him to keep going, as such difficult phases were inevitable in a high-pressure job. Sonny, all of your own age are young and ambitious. Keep going, I would say. Keep going is a message we hear over and over. Walk it off. There's a running joke in the movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding. The protagonist's father, always saying, put some Windex on it, as a way to heal whatever heals. It's a cure-all medicine, and no other is needed. Tough it out is a lesson. It is something you're used to hearing in South Asian culture, where having a high pain threshold is something to brag about, where only a certain kind of pain is permissible, in the end, we never find out if the Windex actually works. There's little data on depression in the South Asian community. According to the Asian Pacific Islander American Health Forum, South Asian Americans, especially those between the ages of 15 to 24, were more likely to exhibit depressive symptoms. Another report revealed that there were a higher rate of suicide among young South Asian American women than the general U.S. population. However, the report said that South Asian Americans had the lowest rate of utilization when it comes to health services. So there's a high need, but a low usage. Immigrant South Asians are particularly prone to depression and related mental health issues. 
A 2004 study examined the qualitative effects of immigration on the mental health of 24 Hindi-speaking women who lived less than five years in Canada. Many of the women polled were in agreement in one fact. They had not experienced mental health issues of any kind in India. You see, in India, you're always busy with your family members and relatives. And here you feel more lonely, you feel more loneliness, said one woman. The vocabulary of certain aches was inaccessible to them, said the woman, but they now had to find words to speak about their pain. This was in part because of a particular stressors unique to the immigrant experience. Most of all, the absence of the supportive community. Part of it was due to the fact, simple fact, that Canadians went to the doctor more. In India, we would only visit the doctor if we were sick, she said. Here, even if you're healthy, you still go for a checkup? As a child, when something bad happened to me, I never wanted to talk about it. Confession was a staple of white culture, I thought. That was why they worked their pain out in therapy and in Mead notebooks, journaling. Some of them made their pain into art, writing memoirs, confessional television shows. It was the white way. But that was not the brown way. The brown way preferred silence. In a community that valorizes endurance, stoicism is a lionized mode of existence. Especially when the community is in question, is in America and subjected to the social pressure of conforming to a model minority stereotype. To admit the cracks within the community would be to question the status that Indian Americans enjoy when mainstream society. The pressure to live up to that perceived social position has been directly cited as one of the reasons that young South Asian women do not call for assistance. This tendency to underestimate, smooth over, and finally deny pain is what keeps young brown people from calling things by their true names. We live in a world where the only metric is other people. Other people, we are told, have it so much worse than we do, so shut up. And so, what other people might perceive as crisis point is not really treated as one. An investigation of psychological distress in South Asian women in the UK revealed that crucial mental health services were routinely assessed at a point of desperation, actually when it's way too late. The stigma surrounding the breaking of silence in Desi communities means that people within them have a higher risk of reporting to self-harm and suicide. More important than other people always having it worse than we do, other people in our Desi communities are always watching. South Asian culture is overall community culture. The concept of izat, or honor, is paramount to those raised in a traditional South Asian family. It's linked to the concept of sharam, or shame. When we tell each other stories about how we're doing, we gloss over the weak parts. They're believed to be private matters. Dave was just made partner at his firm, we'll say, and we won't tell each other that Dave drinks too much, even if we know. And maybe we don't because Dave has been taught to hide his drinking. We think what we see is all there. I had everything, but life is a double-edged sword. Knowing what I know about the very real consequences of denying my own pain, I feel the urge to censor myself, to qualify any confessional writing about pain with, I know other people have it much, much worse. As I've been taught, the culture of silence is so deeply rooted in me, in we desis, that some of us may never overcome it in our lifetimes. If I tell everything, I will lose everything. We are careful with our stories, we edit them compulsively, so they seem less raw, less painful. Here's what I believe. There's no inherent value in silence. There's no value in pretending that we're never hurt. There's no shame in needing medicine. There's none in confession either. We don't have to cling on to the illusion of perfection. We have everything, but life is a double-edged sword. When we tell each other this, we might risk our reputation, but this is really the only way we can survive. 
That story resonates with so many individuals, not only that I've met, but in the communities that My Sahana works with. If you go onto My Sahana's webpage, you'll see individual stories of people who have talked about the kind of challenges. And they're starting to share that. They're starting to break the silence. So when we look at kind of the demographics, right, we have 3.4 million South Asians living in within the US. That's not a small number, not at all. And 80% of them are Indians. That number represents the number of people worldwide affected by depression, 350 million. 800,000 represents the estimated number of people globally who do die by suicide each year. Our young population, 11% are the adolescents who actually have been diagnosed with a depressive disorder by the age of 18. And look at this number, 70 to 90 percent demonstrate improvement with resources and support, talking, medication, community. So when I think about all those numbers that are distributed and the fact that we can actually do something about it, my question is always like, why aren't we doing it? Why aren't we doing more? Well, part of the reason why is that there are certain myths that tend to block the way we think about reaching out for resources. And we've talked about these a lot, right? Stress and anxiety. How do we manage stress and anxiety? It was beautifully illustrated in that story, right? We pretend it's not there, we manage it all. Ron and Prina had talked about managing all kinds of things, right? That schedule, I saw that schedule and I was like, oh my goodness, that's me too. I'm aware. But awareness can only do one piece of that, right? What do I need to do now to go back and behaviorally change some of the things that I do, recognizing that that contributes to the stress of my children as well as my family? One is having an, a recognition that Silicon Valley culture may promote this, but I as an individual, do I need to completely endorse that? Good values. If you have good values, none of these things will happen. But that's not the case, and we all know that. I can only imagine if we all sit and think about the people in our lives, good people in our lives, are they challenged with certain stressors, certain challenges? And again, we always go back to the question of why. Keeping problems to yourself. Again, I took the time to read that um, piece of literature by that young lady, because the silence is one of the key impediments, key barriers in terms of really reaching out within our communities, but within our friends. And this Western concept of, oh, depression, mental health, it's only for white people. If that was only the case. India has one of the largest, largest rates of mental health depression in the world. So we really have to take a look at that. Within the United States, the most populated states with South Asians are California, New York, New Jersey, Texas, and Illinois. Those are our big metropolitan cities. What are we doing in those areas to be able to embrace these kinds of venues, have these kinds of conversations? So a lot of my research in terms of the cultural identity work that I do stems off of Sue and Sue, Daryl Wing Sue. And I find it fascinating work because I work with a lot of South Asian first-gen um, students. I myself am first-gen. I was born and raised in Michigan. And I look at this model and I find it fascinating. So the racial cultural identity model is all about how do we look at the communities in which we exist? What are the in-groups, the out-groups? What's the majority group and what is the minority group? And then where do I plug myself in that? So when you look at conformity, this is a stage. There are actually stages that help us navigate through this. It's not an order. You can actually kind of bounce around and move around throughout these stages. But conformity stage is all about idealizing the white society. For those of you that have teens, how many of you, how many of you or at least I've heard these stories, I don't know why my mom keeps making me take roti to school. I don't want to take it anymore. 
Part of that is not a uh, rejection of rotis, because we all know how good they are. Part of it is a rejection of, I needed to claim a different identity. And the association with the roti symbolizes what? Well, it's the whatever that individual has made meaning around and whatever that context or community has created for them. Are majority of their classmates bringing South Asian food to school? Are they buying, school from, buying lunch from school? There's lots of variables that f filter into that. Dissonance, this is where conflict arises, where, wait a second, I really like what my South Asian culture brings for me. Resistance and immersion, this is where a lot of guilt, shame, frustration surfaces, but on the end of that comes this confidence in who you are. You start to identify what aspects of my identity do I want to embrace. The introspection, feelings also start to intensify even more here about what is my identity really centered around. And then the integrative awareness. I like to joke that this is the one where I can wear a miniskirt and a sari, not at the same time, but feel comfortable in both, right? I've been able to blend the beauty of both cultures. I've been able to identify the challenges in each of the cultures that I actually say, you know what, that's not something I want to embrace. Why do I bring this into play? Because again, looking at the statistics and the data in terms of the number of immigrants that come, how much do our values play into how we raise our children, how we interact with our communities and society? A large piece of it. So having an understanding makes a huge difference. Um, because we're short on time, I just want to go through this very quickly in terms of adolescence. It's a very trying and challenging time for those of us that have moved from adolescence um, many, many, many years ago, it's hard to reflect and think back to what those things were, what those challenges were. And these are universal traits. Early adolescence, 10 to 14 years, a struggling question is, am I normal? So again, you look back at the racial cultural identity model, well, what is normal? Middle, who am I and where do I belong? And the late, 17 to 21, we don't oftentimes think that adolescence goes that late. Where am I going? So some of the things, I, again, just quick highlight, the adolescent brain. It's like having a sports car, but not knowing how to use the brakes as effectively. The way the adolescent brain matures, it actually matures from the back to the front. So if you think about what's in the back of your brain, it's kind of like your emotional response center, your amygdala is what they call it. That's kind of the fight or flight response. That's what keeps us safe. That's what really doesn't have that conscious, wait, that might not be the right decision. That's your frontal lobe. And that develops closer as we get to 25. It's always developing. But really, when you think about some adolescents, you're like, really? Did you think that was the smartest decision? Actually, they did. Sleep is very, very critical. This is where consolidation of learning takes place. This is where they get to restore their energy. They get to find that sense of calm and that emotional well-balance. Hormones, we're not going to go into that. And then open window. This is the opportunity to influence, right? You throw good stuff in that window, good stuff rises. You throw bad stuff in that window, that's what starts to influence. You know, because of the timing, I think I'll pass on the video. Thanks. So how do we start talking about resiliency? And why is that important? Brene Brown, who has done tremendous amount of research, I encourage you to Google her TED Talks, listen to how she reframes what it means. But I truly believe this, owning your story is the bravest thing you will ever do. So when we talk about mental health, how do we own parts of it that we're comfortable with, where we start to share? Because that's truly what starts to break the silence and open that dialogue and allows our communities to help each other. Again, that statistic. The highest percentage of treatment is most effective in this environment. So time for action. What's the call to action here? I want each and every one of you to think about why we judge. The very first slide I asked you to think about when I say the word mental health. What can you look at differently when it comes to that? 
You know, it's like looking at someone that has a broken arm and a cast. Well, just get over it. You should get better. Mental health, you can't see it. So you don't know what kinds of wounds, what kinds of sadness an individual walks around with. And if you knew, would that make a difference? So I encourage you to challenge how you judge. You know, I moved here from Chicago six years ago, and one of the things that, that was just very um, shocking in Silicon Valley is that, that competition. Having two young kids, a seven-year-old and a nine-year-old, in terms of hearing parents competing about academics and all of that. And I had a friend that said, well, that's society. And I responded with, that's society, but I'm part of that society. And if I can take a stand to say, wait a second, how can we not judge? How can we not be so critical? How can we actually support that mother who's dealing with a child who's got some kind of emotional disturbance versus judging and saying, well, they didn't do this or they didn't do that or the mother's pregnancy was X, Y, Z? Sends a very different message. We become more compassionate and more kind. Awareness is a first step, so owning our stories. I don't think any single person in this room has had a super, super, super easy life. You walk the golden road. If you did, um, I want to meet you. <laughs> if not, the challenges that you've encountered that you may have just kind of brushed off in terms of not being such a big deal are things that really shaped you to who you are today. And that's where the resilience comes into play. The empathy, the education, and listening. Really listening. The work that I do with women and adolescents, our youth, oftentimes it's just about taking that moment to listen to what it is that they want to share and what it is that they want to say and to actually talk about their struggles. So there are many, many, many more resources, but I just wanted to share this. Um, again, my Sahana, there's flyers out there. Of course, the Palo Alto Medical Foundation and then the South Asian Heart Center. So I'll leave it at that. If there's any questions. Thank you. Uh, can I say a few words? Thank you so much. It was very nice. Itna acha bolne ke baad I have two lines to say. Kuch zakhm hai jo dikhte nahi, par ye mat samjhiye ki wo dukhte nahi. So ye mental health hai. Thank you so much. Could you translate? Oh, uh, translate. There's some hurt that cannot be seen, but it doesn't mean that it cannot be felt. Mm. I guess that's the translation, yes, but yes. Um, but yeah. Any questions for um, so Abindu? Very short, very short question, please. We don't have much time. <laughs> I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. So um, I just love the talk. Thank you so much for that. In fact, uh, one of the things what you talked about in terms of uh, being vulnerable. So it's it's culturally, of course, it's hard for us as South Asians to open up to somebody else. Now uh, to even take that first step of feeling vulnerable. Mm -hmm. uh, are there some um, something which you advise, you know, even for us to take the first step to go talk to someone, like talk to a professional or uh, talk to a consultant, um, how do we go about doing that? Is it, can you give us some kind of a thing where we can make that first step sure. towards feeling vulnerable? No, absolutely, Kishan. And going to a therapist, as again I mentioned earlier, is oftentimes the final step, right? So even if we could move that up a little bit, but something as simple as journaling could be something that you do very privately. It's something that you engage. Part of why I went into the field of mental health is I grew up in a very rural area in Michigan. It was very mono-ethnic. I had individuals that came by going, does that come off? My skin color. <laughs> and I said, aren't you laying out in the sun to look like me? Hold on, wait a second. So for me, the cultural family values was so embedded. And so for us to feel and be exposed to Indian or being South Asian or being, you know, Kerala, Malayali, we had a drive to go into those communities. And those communities, because they were touch point, it was kind of like, everything's great, everything's great, everything's great. And for me, sometimes I would go through those racial cultural stages and go, wait a second, there's none of the kids in my class look like that, sound like that, dress like that, eat like that but who do I go talk to? My father particularly used to say, be an ambassador for Indian culture, talk about it. But before I could talk about it, I journaled, I wrote. 
So you could write, you could have that one friend that you kind of just share nuggets of information to see, okay, how are they gonna respond? Or you say, look, I'm gonna share something with you that's really hard for me. Don't judge me. Say it and then kind of sit back. We kind of have to prep people because you know, if you're always seen as the strong one, again, the model minority myth, if you're always seen as that icon of perfection, it is so much harder, so much harder to say, oh, I totally made a mistake. I have a question. I mean, how many of you are techies here amongst all of us? A lot of us techies. Uh, so I just wanted to quickly, really quickly, if you could address uh, the kind, I mean, I don't know if you've seen people who have these kind of stressors, you know, when they, a lot of us, how many of us have stressful deadlines, projects? How many of us, how many of us have like almost felt like, oh my God, I can't handle this anymore. It's really too much. So if you could tell us some really quick tips that they can practice, uh, what can they do? I mean, the ultimate resources are all up there, but they can come talk to you or yeah. my Sahana. But if you could give us some quick tips on a day-to-day -day basis, what they can sure, practice. Sure, practical steps, I love that. Um, time management, right? Is everything a deadline? Is everything a deadline? And if it feels that way, we're not prioritizing effectively. You know, I think about this all the time. It's, you know, I hear people say, I'm so busy. There's a great book written by Tony Krabby called Busy. And the culture of busyness and how if we're not indicating that we're busy, we're seen as inadequate somehow. When the reality is, is that if you can't prioritize, I have two hours to play with my kids. I could use that two hours to respond to email, but you know what, Monday morning comes, I haven't heard from you, Bindu, da, 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 da. I have to deal with that, right? It's, it's a way to manage in our minds of how, what the perception of time really means to us. So time management, structure down, literally write down, I will do this with a lot of executives. Seven o'clock, your day starts, just like Ron and Berna had on the, on the slide. Seven o'clock starts, what are you doing? Seven to 7.30, 7.30 to eight. And first get an assessment. What are the valuable things that you're doing? What are the things that are kind of priority B? And what are things that you're just stressing yourself out because you want to be that type A individual? That's one piece. Delegation is a gift. Delegation is a gift. Again, I do a lot of leadership development work. And when I look at the leaders who are able to delegate, you know what they're doing? They're creating space and time for them to think more creatively. And that's what leaders get paid to do. How can you delegate certain things, right? I work full time. I have my happy leader executive coaching. I'm a mother and a wife. You better believe my kids are doing laundry. They're helping because I can't. And the explanation is, you know, if all four of us chip in and do it, that makes that's four times less of the time that mommy could be spending with you. And they get that. Or make it an activity that we do together. So a couple things there. There's a whole long list, but. You can uh, talk to Binduji. She's going to be here for a little bit, so you can talk to her after this as well. But thank you so much. It was an incredible uh, uh, session that we had with you.